Hallelujah. Now, I, I appreciate that applause, but can you just give a big shout out to Jesus in this place today? Or you can do better than that. Come on, give a shout. Come on, come on. Praise him with a voice of triumph. Hallelujah. Listen, what a privilege and an honor it is to be with you this morning. I was sitting there watching Pastor Paul, and I said, no wonder the devil hates him. If he's not singing, he's playing the guitar. If he's not playing the guitar, he's playing the piano. If he's not playing the piano, he's making a baby. I don't know what this guy's doing. Can you just praise God for Pastor Paul and Pastor Ashley? They are a phenomenal, phenomenal couple. Uh, we were introduced by Bishop Jakes in person one day at a dinner. And um, I sat across the table and I knew then, and we said this to each other, we text each other, and I said, man, I just met you a few hours ago, but I know I just met a brother for life. And uh, we've been friends for years, and I just honor you. Uh, this is an amazing ministry, Victory. You've done so much. I understand this is the 40th year. So that means this church was started in 1981. I was born July 6, 1981. So while Pastor Billy was building this church, my mom and dad were making me. And so I guess this is my year of victory. Yeah. Listen, um, I wrote a book uh, called The Shift, um, and it was released March 24th, which was the same day that the mayor of the city of Houston shut the city down for the pandemic. And so I was one of the first authors, if not one of the first author uh, with our publishing company that had to learn how to sell a book without having any in-person venues. All of the venues were canceled. Uh, and so uh, we still praise God that in spite of not having one in-person gathering in that entire year as it related to the book, it was still number one for three weeks. And I praise God for it. And so um, if, you, if you would like to, uh, to read it, it's, it's on, you can go to my website, keonhendersonbook.com, uh, or you can go to Amazon or Books a Million or uh, any place. I think they sell them at Popeye's Chicken. I'm not sure. I hope they do. But anywhere they sell books, you can definitely get it. I've got a, a free copy. Does anybody have a birthday today? Is it anybody's birthday? Come get this book. That's, that's, Y'all give her a hand. This is for you. There you go. Happy birthday. She says she's 60 years old. Wow. Well, I'm so, I'm so honored to be here. Um, there could have been a million people here. Pastor Paul knows people all over the world, uh, but he, he allowed me to be here with you, and I'm so grateful. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. I'm excited to share this word with you. As I shared with the Saturday uh, crowd yesterday, I was going to preach a different message at every service. I wasn't going to preach the same one. Um, I wanted to take you on a journey, and we're going to be going through the book of Philippians. Um, and Paul wrote this book, not Pastor Paul, but Paul the Apostle, and he probably does that too. Did you ever write a book in the Bible, sir? You do everything else? No? All right. So we, um, we, we're excited about this, and I want to take you on a journey. to this. Yesterday, we were in Philippians 1 and 6, and, and we talked about the scripture, uh, he who has began a good work in me shall establish it until the day of Jesus Christ, and we called it, uh, he's a promise keeper. And, and I wanted the people to know that God is obligated. Listen to this. No matter how many faults and failures you have, if God gave you a gift and he initiated something in your spirit, he is obligated to perform it. He cannot let anything that he started go unfinished. So that means that if God gave you the business idea, even though you haven't accomplished it yet, it is absolutely going to happen because God is obligated to finish everything that he started. Can you say man? Well, let's go to Philippians chapter 3. Let's go to chapter 3, and you know this one, I can tell. Verse 13, it says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind me and reaching forth unto those things which are before me. I press toward the mark for the prize of the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. My favorite part of that is not that I can do all things. I like that part, but that isn't the part that I like the most. The part that I want to talk about today 
is when he said, forgetting those things which are behind me. I want to use a subject today called memory loss. Memory loss. And, and the reason why I want to talk about that uh, is because I think that one of the detriments to your success is that you remember too much. Everybody's afraid to lose their memory. We're taking omega ones, twos, threes, omega six thousands. Everybody's taking all of these things just to improve their memory because we think that it's a great thing to remember. But what if I told you that one of the most detrimental things you could do to your destiny is remember your past? There's an old saying that says, yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery. The only thing that you have is a gift, which is why they call it the present. It's the power of now. I'm not a huge baseball fan, but I went to a baseball game the other day. Uh, the L.A. Dodgers were playing the Houston Astros, and, and we were there in, in the Minute Maid Park in Houston, and, and I was watching the pictures throw the ball over and over again, and it reminded me of a man that, any sports fan in the house? Any baseball people? Uh, there was a guy uh, way back in the day um, in the 70s uh, playing baseball, I think even maybe back into the 60s, if I'm not mistaken. But this guy, uh, his name is Tommy John. And he was a pitcher. And um, he was one of the greats of all time. Uh, but in this particular uh, reiteration of the story, after throwing the pitch repetitive, repetitively, uh, the story is told that he uh, blew out his arm or he, he, he permanently damaged a ligament in his pitching elbow from throwing the ball over and over and over again. He struck out many people over and over and over again. And that's where some of you all are in your life right now because a tendon is the thing that connects two joints and causes and allows for flexibility without injury. And, and he threw that ball over and over again, uh, but, but he injured that tendon. And see, that's one of the things that the devil does to you is because success requires you to do things over and over again, and he'll cause you to hurt in an area where you cannot perform that task over and over again. So you have to love every day, but sometimes the enemy will try to hurt your heart so that you can't do it. And, and, and you have to forgive every day. And I remember uh, riding in the car with Travis today, excuse me, Nathan today, and he was telling me about something that Pastor Billy said, and it, and it shook me to my core. Uh, and he was talking about Pastor Paul's mom and dad, uh, who I think were some of the greatest leaders in the history of the Christian world. And he said that, that she said that you you can make it if you just don't get bitter. Amen. When I tell you, it just, it touched me down to my heart because if you get bitter, you cannot get better. If you get injured in your heart, then you cannot love. And the Bible says that they will know we are Christians by our love. And that's why the enemy is trying to hurt your heart because through love, you can achieve so much. And if you cannot love, then you are just sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Tommy was known as one of the greatest pitchers, pitchers of all time. Just to put this into perspective, he pitched to Mickey Mantle and Mark McGuire. Somebody, some of the women are looking at me like, can you please get out of the sports analogy? I have no idea what you're talking about. Okay, let me do it this way. He played 26 seasons. He, he, his career was so long that John F. Kennedy was president when he started and George Herbert Walker Bush was president when he retired. Does that help? Okay, uh, let me put, Mary Kay was doing good. Let me, I'm trying to find something. <laughs> Mary Kay was giving out pink Cadillacs and you could be diamond in the company. Does that help anybody? He, he, he was a pitcher for such a long time. Halfway through his, his, uh, his career, he blows out his elbow and it just so happens at that time they had a clinical trial study of a surgery that could take the healthy tendon from the other elbow and replace it in the hurt arm. And today we call that the Tommy John surgery. That's the surgery. It's named after him. And do you know that he blew his arm out? But after they fixed his elbow and this surgery that they had concocted, the doctor told him, sir, you have a 99% chance of failure. I can only guarantee with the accuracy of 1% that this surgery will work. Most people would have retired. Who goes into surgery with only 
of a chance. Who does that? I mean, it, it, for me to do it, they would have had to talk 50, 60, 70, 80, but 1%, 1%, I say, you know what? It's the Lord's will. I'll just leave this arm where it is because there's no way I'm going under the knife and going through rehab for 1%, but he did it. And after he came back from that surgery, he went on to play another 13 seasons. He won another 164 games with a 1% chance. And when asked, why did he do it? And how did he have enough guts to stay with it? He says, I have always learned to divide my life into two categories, things I can control and things I cannot. And I came all the way from Houston to tell you that there are only two things that you can control in your life, the things that you can and the things that you cannot. And you cannot spend your life worried about things that are outside of your control. If God gives you a 1% chance, how many of you know that with 1% you can do all things? Through Christ Jesus, who gives you strength. Somebody say amen. amen. You know, we've seen triumphs like this recently. I was, I'm, I'm a sports guy. You know, I remember when Kobe Bryant tore his Achilles and went back up to the free throw line and knocked down two free throws and walked off the court on his own. I remember watching Tiger Woods have back surgery. Remember, he fell down and he came back to win. And most recently, I don't know if we have any golf fans, and ladies, just stick with me. I promise this may be my last sports analogy. We just saw Phil Mickelson at 50 years old be the oldest person to win a major. And they are doing studies now and they're finding out that people like LeBron James who are 36 and Carmelo Anthony at 37 and Vince Carter who was 40 years old and played 22 seasons and still performing at a high level. We are now learning that we don't just play sports with our bodies, we play it with our minds. And if you learn that you don't play life with your body, that you play life with your mind, that you have to understand that whatever the mind believes it can achieve and if you learn to play the game of life with your mind you will know that those of us who have a new mind in Christ we can do things I want to talk to people today who understand that will tell the devil you can attack my body you can attack my money you can attack my family but as long as I keep thinking on these things as long as I continue to believe my family my money my business my entire reputation reputation rest on the fact that I am a thinker and a thinker. Do I have any thinkers? And do I have any thinkers? Tommy John succeeded with a 1% chance. That was then. This is now. Do you know that your 1% chance is better than the enemy's 99%? That they can tell you that your child only has a 1% chance to go to college. That's good. One of my favorite movies is Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> I think Jim Carrey is one of the most hilarious people who have ever breathed air in the world. And you remember he was talking to the girl um, that uh, Miss Samsonite is what he called her. And he followed her all around to give her a suitcase full of IOUs because he had already spent the money. And when he gets to the hotel room, he says to her, he says, he says, Mary, what are the chances that a guy like me can get with a girl like you? And her response was, for those of you who haven't seen the movie, she said, about one in a million? He said, so you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> All it takes is one, one thought, one idea, one step forward. The journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. You don't need a lot of friends. You just need one good friend. You don't need a whole lot of ideas. You just need one good idea. You don't need a whole lot of anything. You can do it. Listen, God can do anything in your life with just one step. Somebody say one step. I want you to know that you cannot control the economy. You cannot control the weather. Women, you cannot control the fact that you are a female working in a male-dominated field. None of that you can control. You couldn't control who you were born to. You couldn't control if you were born in North Tulsa. You couldn't control if you were born in South Tulsa. I did not choose to be born in Gary, Indiana, but that's where God stood me up. And yes, that is where Michael Jackson is from. And no, I do not know him, so don't ask me. 
I have one story. My uncle said Tito borrowed a nickel from him and he hasn't paid him back. And with the interest, he should be rich. That's the only Michael Jackson story I have. You can't control where you were born. You cannot control Moses if you were born with a speech impediment. You cannot control if your mother abandons you in the Nile River and leaves you for dead. But God is in control. And he'll make sure that Pharaoh's daughter is taking a bath at the particular place where you have been left and brings you into the house of Pharaoh. And now the man who was looking to kill you has to raise you. And if you remember that story, the Bible says that as his, his, his surrogate mother, watch this, she finds Moses and then realizes he's an infant. And back in those days, they didn't have Similac. They didn't have Infamil, so if a, if a child was going to eat, it had to be at the breast of his mother. And guess what? All of a sudden, this woman who abandons her child, when she is looking for somebody, she finally finds this woman who is still lactating. And she says, guess what? I just found a baby. And, and she doesn't know that she found the baby of the lady that she's talking to. And she says, guess what? If you'll breastfeed this baby, I will pay you to do it. Look at God paying her to do what she would have done for free. And do you know that God has a check and he has resources and he has something with your name on it? And yes, you have to go through pain to get it. And yes, you have to go through hell and high water to get it. And yes, you have to cry at night to get it. But when God gets done with you, I promise you victory. You're going to come forth like pure gold. When God gets done with this church, the next 40 years will be greater than the previous 40 years. And what God did in the life of the previous leader, he's going to do double in the life of the current leader and if God is true the anointing falls down that whatever happens in his life is getting ready to happen in your life and I speak prosperity into your life and I speak healing into your life and I speak health into your life somebody shout amen hello everyone I have to stop right in the middle of this riveting conversation and let me tell you right now they are clawing at me to get back to the second half so I've got to get to this portion where I give you an opportunity to give. You know, I used to say when I was a younger pastor, it's time to take up the offering. But you understand, I understand now that you don't take offerings. You give people an opportunity to be generous because you can't beat God given. The more you give to him, the more he gives to you. Our team is getting ready to put up a link right on your screen to show you ways you can give. You can give through our app. You can text it. You can go to our website, and if you are a part of our Lighthouse 2.0, which is the growing, the fastest growing portion of our ministry, you can go to Givelify, and you can give there. We are excited to attempt, at least, to bring you riveting, fresh rhema word on a weekly basis. We thank you because you could go any place on this world wide web, but weekly, you choose to be with us, and we are excited about that. So give and it shall be given unto you, good measure. Press down, it's gonna be shaken together and it's still gonna be running over. Now let me get back to this for they run me over. You don't want to miss what's about to happen next. Check this out. God is gonna do a great thing in your life, but let me tell you something. Are you ready? If you're perfect, you're not a candidate. He only blesses incomplete people. He only blesses people who need him. All others he calls pious. He calls them Pharisees and Sadducees. He has no need for them. He's always looking for the broken. I came to seek and save that which is lost, not that which is found. I am looking for a seeker. I am looking for the brokenhearted. I am looking for the one who will be on the cross and say, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And I will ignore everything else and say, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. He says, I forgot those things that are behind me. I forgot that I was raised by a single parent. I forgot that we grew up poor and my mother worked at Taco Bell and raised four children on $7 an hour. I forgot 
that the average age of a young African-American man on the street that I grew up on Ellsworth Place was 25. That means that I should have been dead 15 years ago. I forgot that I was raised by a single mother who was the son of the pastor of the church who was still married when I was born. I forgot that the high school dropout rate in the high school that I went to was 30% and the unemployment rate in the city where I was born was 40%. I forgot all of those things, but I pressed toward the mark for the prize of the upward call. And when I look at this word, I realize that the greatest enemy of us is the inner me. Did you hear what I said? Sometimes your greatest enemy is the inner me. It is what you say to yourself. It is how you speak to yourself. It is your inability to get past things and that you always have to figure things out. So how do we forget? When I looked up the word forget in the Greek, it actually means to abandon. It means that if I have this thought, I have to literally intentionally leave it behind. In the city I grew up in, there are abandoned buildings everywhere, abandoned houses. And what happens is, is when you abandon a thing, it begins to fall apart and it loses value. I could go to my hometown right now in Gary, Indiana and buy a brand new, well, excuse me, an old house and, and make a brand new house on a lot for pennies on the dollar. Why? Because the property is so cheap because when the jobs left and the steel mills left and everything left and industry changed, everybody abandoned the city. And so now you can get into the city at a lesser price. Why? Because when the thing is abandoned, it loses value. And the only reason why your thoughts still have so much value in your head is because you won't abandon them. You have to abandon them. You have to leave them behind. And how do you leave them behind? You have to pay them no attention. See, when you ignore a thought, then you don't pay it attention. And when you don't pay it attention, it loses value. And when it loses value, then you won't pass it down to your children. And when you don't pass it to your children, they won't pass it to their children. And then you will make a generational shift because you decided that you will forget those things that are behind you. you see, when you cross the street... When you cross the street, the only thing you should be paying attention to is the direction of traffic and the speed of traffic. You shouldn't be paying attention to the colors of the car. I've never seen anybody step in the middle of the highway and say, let me dodge the red car. Because when you're in the middle of traffic, it doesn't matter if the car is white, it doesn't matter if the car is blue, it doesn't matter if the car is silver. All you need to know is you need to get out of the way and you need to get out of the way quick. And the reason why some of us are stuck in life is because the enemy has us in the traffic of life trying to figure out what's the color of the car. You've paying attention to the wrong details. All you need to do is pay attention to the speed. And, and, and you've got to understand that most of the companies that you go to and that you buy things from, they all started in tough times. Did you know that? That 50% of Fortune 500 companies started in an economic downturn. Are you listening to me? 50%, not five of them, 250 of the current Fortune 500 companies Started in economic depressions. Fortune magazine was started in the crash of 29. FedEx, the crisis, the oil crisis of 73. UPS started in the crisis. Disneyland, Walt Disney started in the crash of 1929. Costco, any Costco shoppers in here? Started in a crisis. Started in a crisis. General Motors started in a crisis and just almost caused another not too long ago, but we're not going to get into that. Microsoft started in a crisis. The Lighthouse Church, the church that I pastored, started in 2009 in an in a economic downturn, and nobody gave us any hope. They told us we wouldn't last a year. Everybody was closing and foreclosing on their houses. But let me tell you what, what, what you have. And, and this church, because I read up on the history of this church, this area where you are used to be depressed swampland. Pastor Billy walked up on it and told his boys, what do you see? And the boy said, Dad, we see a football field. What else do you see? We see soccer fields. What else do you see? We see a Christian school. What else do you see? And guess what? Everything they saw, you see. 
Sometimes you have to walk in the middle of a, of a nothingness and you have to walk in the middle of nothing and say, I see, I see, I see a business, I see a company, I see success. And you know what? If you have the ability to see it, then you will be able to see it. Humanity's biggest challenge is that we're always remembering. We remember everything everybody did to us. How many of you will be honest? You can, you can think of two things right now. If God would let you go to heaven and hold a grudge. <laughs> Come on, guys. Be honest with me. It's, it's not that you don't want to hold a grudge. You just don't want to put eternity at stake. If, there, if, there's a color, if, you, if you said, God, okay, God, just give me 30 minutes to go get them back. And you forgive me? You promise? Okay, I'll be right back. <laughs> Some of us are so hurt that we travel back in time to get even. But let me tell you something. If you don't mind, come here real quickly. Just, just stand right here at this, at this edge. See, right now, he and I are even. And see, the problem is, is God wants to put you here, but you want to get even. And you don't recognize that every time you get even with somebody, you have to go backwards. You can never, thank you, get ahead of anybody you're trying to get even with. You've got to let it go. Negative thoughts, negative perceptions, a boss that didn't like you, somebody that got promoted and you had more experience. None of that matters because when God gets ready, when he gets ready, he'll take you from the back of the line and put you in the front of the line. I know that to be true. Can you say amen? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what's going on. Great is he that is in me than he that is in the world. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you were not tall. It doesn't matter if you couldn't sing. It doesn't matter if you can't play instruments. When you find out who you are, you'll be the greatest in the world at being it. I tell all of people at our church all the time, here's my advice to you. Please, I'd rather you be an original you than a cheap imitation of someone else. The world is looking for you. The world is looking for you. Somebody say, the world is looking for me. And when you become what you should be, then the world will be better because God gave you a gift that he didn't give anybody else. And he put it in a package that's not like anybody else. And you don't have to change your shape. You don't have to change your hair color. The world is looking for somebody that looks just like you. So when you wake up in the morning, I want you to look in the mirror and, I say, and say to yourself, I am all of that. Just say it right now. Just practice. I am all of that. And as a matter of fact, just look at your neighbor and say, do you know how blessed you are that God let you sit next to me? Did you know that you're sitting next to a rock star? Did you know you're sitting next to the next CEO of a company? Did you know that you're sitting next to a millionaire? No, I don't have the money yet, but I speak it by faith. How many of you know that at least on some occasions, God is okay with you not telling the truth? Oh, I know I shocked them right now, Pastor. They're like, why did you bring this guy here to speak heresy in the pulpit? I can prove it to you. How many of you need me to prove it? Anybody need me to prove it? Sometimes God says that you don't have to tell the truth. You want the scripture? Let the weak say I'm strong. Let the poor say I am rich. What he's telling you is that you do not have to repeat your circumstance. That you have the power to say whatever you want no matter what it looks like. That you have the power to speak a thing even though it is not. And death and life is where? In the power of the tongue. So I want you to spend about 30 seconds speaking over your life, speaking over your children, speaking over your finances, speaking over your health. How dare you just put your hand on your head and say this body is healed. I don't care what the doctor said. I don't care that cancer runs in my family. I dry it up in the name of Jesus. I don't care that hypertension runs in my family. I dry it up in the name of Jesus. I don't care that my father had a stroke. I shall live and not die. Why? Because I said so. You have to learn to forget. You must learn that this moment is not your life. It's just a moment. How many of you all have a tendency to panic when things don't go right? Let me see any honest people. Isn't that just, just, just panic? What am I going to do? What, they're saying this and how am I going to recover? And, 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 and my, my father used to say, worrying is like sitting in a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but you don't get anywhere. Just, 
just rocking, spinning the energy, only to get up in the same place. You've got to learn to forget. Any, any animal lovers? Isn't it true dogs have great memories, but they also don't? I mean, they, they, they remember, but they don't remember. It's like they, they know where the food is, but they don't know they shouldn't chew the shoe. Right? They, 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 they know that they, that they shouldn't, but it's, it's, like, it's like they remember, but they don't remember. It's, it's like they have a short memory. You can fuss at a dog, and they'll turn and not look at you. Like, I have a little Bichon, and, and I used to fuss at him when, he was, when we were potty training him, and, and I would say, no, you shouldn't do that, and he would just say. But he would do it again the next day. And then the next day, until he got big enough to learn to go on his own. But he has such a great memory because even, even he, would, he would know how to get home. He got out of the gate a couple times, he came home, but, but then he wouldn't remember. There's certain things that he just wouldn't remember. And that's why we call, if you ever heard great athletes and they say, man, he's a beast or he's an animal, what that means is, is that he has the ability to forget. See, he doesn't step up to the free throw line and remember the last free throw. He just shoots this one like he, he, he didn't miss the other one. Or like a golfer, he, he steps up and he puts the ball. Because if you play golf and you remember the bad shot, then it's going to follow you to the next hole. So you just got to forget it and you just got to go and do it all over again. And what I am trying to tell you today is that life is a game. And if you remember everything that happened to you, you will not get all of it. He said, I forgot those things that were behind me. And let me add this too because I don't think that most people understand that when Paul says I forgot those things that were, that were behind me he wasn't just saying that I forgot my good experiences and my bad ones he's saying listen I forgot my successes and I forgot my failures because sometimes we can remember our successes and that gets us in trouble too Amen. do you know why Moses didn't get into the promised land his memory was too good Remember, the Bible says that God told Moses to do what? Speak to the rock and water would come out of it. What did Moses do? He struck it. And do you know why he struck it? Because the last time he struck the rock, water came out of it. So now God says, I'm going to change it. I want you to speak to it. But Moses used his memory and he said, nope, striking works. And he struck the rock. And because he remembered his last successes, he couldn't get the promised land. Sometimes you even have to forget what worked. Amen. Sometimes you have to do it all over and do it God's way. Amen. The altars of churches all around the world are full of people praying every week over a struggle that they don't have the ability to forget. And that's why we don't get healed. And that's why we don't get whole. Because we continue to remember. But Paul said, can I advise you, Victory Church? I just press toward the mark for the prize of the upper call. And nothing in the scripture says what the prize was. We don't know what the prize is. So we cannot talk about the prize, but we can talk about the pressing. He just kept pressing forward. And I came here today to tell somebody, just keep pressing forward. I don't know what you feel like, but just keep pressing forward. I don't know if you're battling with depression, but keep pressing forward. I don't know if you're battling with rejection, but keep pressing forward. I don't know if you feel insecure, but keep pressing forward. Because my Jesus was the rejected stone, but later on, he became the chief cornerstone. And I don't know who you are. I don't know if you've been forgotten. I don't know if you've been overlooked, but somebody just shout, I press. Say it again, I press. I press toward the mark of the upper call. I press until I finish writing the book. I press until I finish writing the song. I press until the company is profitable. I press until my children graduate from college. I don't have the money, but I have the press. I don't have the notoriety, but I have the press. I don't have the checkbook, but I have the press. I don't know the mayor, but I know the presser. I don't know the president, but I have the press. I don't know the governor, but I have the press. I don't have a stock fund, but I have the press. My portfolio is not 
diversified, but I have the press. Do I have any pressers in the room? And if you keep on pressing, it will break free for you. If you keep on pressing, God will open up the windows of heaven and pour out on you a blessing you don't have room enough to receive. And I wonder, could I find about 500 people in this room and about 500 of you online who will spend the next 30 seconds thanking God that you are forgetting things that are behind you, thanking God that all things are becoming new. Come on and make some noise and let the devil know that you will not shut up my mouth. You will not shut up my praise. I am a presser. Do I have any pressers in the room? I said, do I have any pressers in the room? I wish I could get somebody to give another neighbor a high five if you are comfortable and say, I'm a presser. I'm a presser. I'm a presser. I'm a fighter. I keep going. I don't quit. I may fall down, but I get back up again. If you do this, nothing can stop you. Nothing can stop you. How many of you know you're unstoppable? I am unstoppable. I'm not perfect, but I'm a presser. I wake up every day pressing toward the mark. Pressing toward the mark. Pressing toward the mark. My mother never had a new car in her entire life. 2016, I bought her her first new car because I was a presser. I was a presser. We walked to school. I was the kid walking to school in the snow, but I was a presser. And I never, ever thought that my reality would be my environment. I never once. I didn't get to bed until I was almost a teenager, but I never once thought that that would be my reality. We, we grew up four kids in one bedroom, but I never thought that that would be the reality for my family. I never thought it. I always pressed. I always thought I always believed. I always knew that there was something bigger that God had for me. I, I didn't have evidence, but I had confidence. I feel the Holy Ghost in this room today. I didn't have evidence, but I had confidence. I had no examples, but I, and I didn't have experience, but I had a willpower to keep on pressing no matter what it looks like. And I want to know, and I wish I could find somebody because sometimes people can misread you and they can think that because of the color of your skin or because of the neighborhood you grew up in or because your parents had money. Just because your parents had money doesn't mean that you have money. Sometimes you have to do it on your own. And I'm looking at some people in here who picked themselves up by the bootstraps and you built your life. And can you just testify to everybody in your area? You are looking at a miracle. How many of y'all have goals? I want you to go get them. Go get all of them. Go get all of them. And sometimes you don't look like it. Did John the Baptist look remotely close to somebody who was speaking for Jesus? <laughs> you remember when the Bible says this man wore hair for clothes. He had camel's hair for clothes. He had a leather belt. What would you do if Pastor Paul came here on a Sunday <laughs> with camel hair and a leather belt? You say, yep, we knew it. He lost his mind. We just, all of the pressure. The Bible says that he ate locusts and honey for meat. A guy in the wilderness, no shower, matted hair, blisters on his lip. Behold, the Son of Man is coming. Sometimes... It takes a broken soul to speak the most powerful words. When Job was laying in ashes and he had blisters all over his body, the Bible says that he picked up shards of clay and began to scratch his skin. What I took away from that is that the glass is broken and so is the man. Sometimes it takes a broken thing to help a broken thing. You are broken just where you need to be. You are fractured just where you need to be. You are fearful just where you need to be. Because God is looking to make a masterpiece. And he couldn't paint it on a canvas that had already had an artist. He needed a blank sheet. You were abandoned just 
by the person you needed to be abandoned by so that you could trust God. I know you didn't want it and you wouldn't have picked it. But his ways are not our ways. And his thoughts are not our thoughts. So as you go after your goals, it's okay to teach your children to be polite. But as you go after these goals, I want you to be aggressive. I've never seen a lion come up on a zebra and say, uh, Mr. Zebra, I just want to let you know I haven't eaten in a few days. And wanted to know if I could chase you, perhaps eat your daughter. If it's, not, if it's okay, okay. If, if it's not a good time, I'll come back tomorrow. And when a lion is ready to eat, it will jump on a giraffe. And when you're hungry for something, you can't be concerned with the size of what it is that you're about to conquer. When God has given you a vision, you can't be concerned with how fast and evasive the goal is. You've got to press toward the mark. Every person in this room and every person watching online, if you're not driving, I want you to stand if you have a goal. If you have a goal in your life, I want you to stand. And I want you to make up in your mind that you're going to chase that goal like a cheetah. I want you to stalk it like a lion. Your children are watching you. Your grandchildren are watching you. Your siblings are watching you. And it is not your fault that you are the leader of the family. It's the way God made it. And you got to take up that responsibility. Take up that cross and bear it. Wasn't your fault that you were the leader. It's not your fault that you were the youngest and you still have to lead the oldest. It wasn't your fault that you're the patriarch or the matriarch. It's just the way it is. God put it on your shoulders because he knew you could handle it. He built you to be able to do this. People look at Pastor Paul, his name rings all around the world. Here's this young kid in a grown man's game with a college and a school and this big campus and stepping in the shoes of a great progenitor and here's this young man leading thousands of people. Can I tell you that from losing his father to every possible bully in high school, to every near-death experience, to every sleepless night and every moment his heart has ever been broken, was all used to make sure that when he got up on this stage, he could be ready for battle. And any church that has a pastor named Paul, you must be blessed. Paul wrote this book and he connected with these people. And I want to pray for you today. What an amazing message. If you was blessed by that message like I was and you haven't had an opportunity to give, if you want to give it an opportunity right now. And we're going to put the instructions right below. Also. If you want to join this Lighthouse family because you love what we're doing, we're going to put those instructions down below as well. Lastly, here at Lighthouse, we believe in discipleship. And we believe that if you confess with your mouth and believe your heart that Jesus is Lord, that you shall be saved. Go ahead. Come on and pray with me. Heavenly Father, you're great. You're amazing. You're holy. And you're worthy. God, we just thank you for the opportunity they got to see this great message. We ask that you allow a God to sink in our heart and bring forth fruit. God, we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Hey, listen, we love you, and there's nothing that you can do about it. Hey, everybody. What's going on? It's PK here. And listen, I want to tell you that I get so many DMs, so many messages of people saying, Pastor, how can I connect with you? I love your messages, but going through YouTube is kind of difficult. Where can I come to a centralized place? We heard you. And that's why we created Lighthouse 2.0. Lighthouse 2.0 is our tribe. 
It's our village. It's the place where all of the people who say, I want PK to be my online pastor. And PK says, I want you to be my online member. This is the place where we go, the watering hole, the ecosystem where we all come to grow together. And it is exclusively for you. They're getting ready to put a link up on the screen right now that shows you how you make that exclusive step. And everybody can't get in. So you better take first mover's advantage and get in while you can fit in. I can't wait to see you inside of 2.0. May God bless you and let's do this thing for Christ.